All right, let's kick it. Happy Sober Day, friends, and welcome to the Sobriety Diaries. My name is Nate, and I am a grateful recovering alcoholic. My personal addiction has shaped the person I am today and given me the ability and voice to help others, and I simply wouldn't be here without it. Recovery is possible. The Sobriety Diaries is a video podcast where we talk to other recovering alcoholics and addicts. We hear their stories and hope to help others who may still be struggling. Head on over to the sobrietydiaries.com where you can apply to be a guest on the show and join our insiders list. But let's get down to the business at hand. Joining us today is Brooke Robichaud, sober entrepreneur, podcast host, author, graphic designer, DIYer. Hey, Brooke, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? And a mother. I forgot to add. Yeah. When do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, yeah, I have not been doing that a lot lately. <laughs> and with the heat wave on top of everything. Goodness. Yeah, I know. I know. We all slept in the living room for the last three days because it's the only place with the air conditioning. So my kids didn't actually go to bed till about 1130 for three nights in a row. And then I, I work when they sleep. So yeah. I was up till 2 a.m. And yeah, it's the life, though. I mean, I sit up way later in addiction. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You know, accomplishing things now and being productive. <laughs> yeah, I know money's going into my bank account when I stay up late. Now. <laughs> Amen. I love it. What made you decide to come on and share your story today? Um, I rarely uh, pass up an opportunity to come and share some experience, strength, and hope. I uh, my life has changed so much because of recovery that I get kind of excited to give it away. Maybe too much sometimes. <laughs> um, but also I had a, a, my younger brother, he was 23 and lost his battle to addiction. So I know a lot of young people consume content online and through podcasting, social media, and that's where I'm speaking up the most and putting my voice out there the most because I really want them, young younger generations to know that you can recover, that's possible, um, and hopefully save any family, even if it's just one from having to go through the devastation of losing someone to addiction. It is something I wouldn't wish on anybody. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Let's open the diary on Brooke. Brooke, why don't you take us through your addiction and your journey to recovery and what life is like today? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me here. I'm also a grateful uh, recovering alcoholic. My name's Brooke. Um, yeah, my addiction really started when I was just a kid. I had a pretty chaotic home. Um, a lot of addiction, abuse, and things were happening at home, and I was trying to find ways to escape from a very, very young age. I used television. I used, um, I had an eating disorder for a while. I used people and trying to fix things and mend things, like anything you could get addicted to. I have definitely been addicted to uh, right away, just trying to find anything to make me feel okay inside. And we lived in a pretty nice neighborhood, but we had a very different family than all of our other neighbors. So I felt really out of place everywhere I was. And I just didn't feel settled anywhere until I found drugs and alcohol. And then all of a sudden it was like everything, all the insecurities, all of the self doubt and worry and anxiety and fears were just gone for a bit. And I felt free to be myself for the first time ever to tell jokes I wanted to tell, to talk to boys I wanted to talk to, to like yes. just be myself. Um, and I thought I found the answer. And I thought everyone else was an idiot for not wanting to drink every day. Cause Same. I'm like, this is it. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. And uh, quickly I went from, well, it actually started with boys. I, I got my first like serious boyfriend and like how vulgar can we be on here? <laughs> It's a, it's an open forum. So whatever you're willing to share. I like, I saw my first penis and then it was all down. From there. Okay. But, Amen, girl. Yeah. I was, <laughs> so I was like 16 and from 16 to 18, I went from being like this goody two shoes, trying to people please everybody going to church to try and find something to make me feel better. Cause all my neighbors went to church and they all looked happy and I'm like, okay, that's where I'm supposed to be. So I'd spend my lunch hours at like youth group at churches. I hung out with bang geeks. I was in drama and I went mm. from that to drinking, using drugs. Um, when I was 18, I ended up like trying pretty much every drug on the planet within those two years. Um, but I ended up crash drunk driving my car into uh, my at the time foster mom's home and uh, almost 
killing my boyfriend and my best friend and got up and didn't even realize what happened. Um, walked into a park that was nearby and tried to buy crack off somebody. <laughs> like wow. that's how fast it progressed for me. And um, yeah, and actually, funny story about crashing my car into. Um, her name was Judy. Her house. <laughs> she left and said, um, "Don't break the house down. Don't set any fires. Don't kill any animals. Don't have any parties." She had four rules for us. So we had a party, which resulted in a fire in the kitchen. I crashed my car into her house, and one of the cats died while she was gone. Like I swear. <laughs> Sorry, Judy. I know. <laughs> like, how is that even possible? I was, I felt cursed. And I al always went into these things with the best intentions. Like, of course, I'm not going to do any of that stuff. Right. You think you're just going to have a party. But then when I start drinking, I can't stop. And I denied I had a problem even then because there was days where I didn't have to drink, where I went to school, like things were fine. And I never had a problem not drinking. It was just when I started drinking, I could not control myself. And I mm -hmm. would go from drinking to drugs and then and things would get so much worse. Um, but I ended up pregnant at 18, right before my 19th birthday. And in Canada, in where I am in Canada, 19 is the legal drinking age. I'm finally <laughs> legally time. allowed in bars. Right. <laughs> And then it's taken away from me. <laughs> um, and I managed to stay sober for a little bit. And, you know, I really struggled with the decision of whether or not to keep uh, my son when I was pregnant. And everyone around me was telling me the responsible thing to do would to not keep my pregnancy. I was homeless. I was sleeping underneath my grandma's coffee table. I just got fired from my job. <laughs> um, I didn't have a relationship. And yeah, it looked pretty bleak. And I felt like, okay, yeah, that's the right answer. But then I got an ultrasound done to see how far along I was. And as soon as I saw this little bean on the screen of like hands and feet kicking, you could kind of see a little nose. I don't know. I just had this feeling like, even though I was telling everybody that was what I was going to do, I was like, there's no way I can do this. Like, I believe in everyone's right to choose that for themselves. But for me, it was like, it's not a choice I can make. Like, I just knew it. But I ended up praying for the first time in, since I was 16, so two years asking for a sign and a literal billboard came up on the side of the road while I'm praying that said abortion stops a beating heart. And I was like, okay, well, there's a sign. <laughs> That's how my higher power works too. He has sick sense of humor. <laughs> and that, that is something that would happen to me. Yeah. Like <laughs> I has to like bang me over the head with it. Cause I want yes. no one less. Yeah. Same. Unless it's literally a billboard. And I believe that the heart that would have stopped would have been mine because I, I truly believe to this day if I didn't have my son and have that break from drugs and alcohol and a little bit of responsibility that I would not be alive today. Hmm. The, the route I was going was just so crazy downhill so fast. Um, everything I said I was never going to do, I was doing. And, uh, and yeah, and so I managed to kind of get my shit together for a year uh, while I was pregnant. Me and his dad got together. Things seemed really nice. We had this cute little place. Um, I felt like things were going really well in my life. I ended up landing an amazing job and ended up being like the youngest salesperson on this team. I was making like so much money for my age. It was insane. Hmm. And I felt so good about myself, like how I was breaking this generational thing that I had lived with of like poverty and addiction and everything. And I felt really, really good. And then I started drinking with people at work and it was just like within another two years, I was lost that relationship. I was doing drugs again. I was hanging out in the downtown East side here, which is a really not great neighborhood, you know, with some really not great people. And I ended up getting assaulted. Um, it was a good friend of mine. I actually worked with her and her boyfriend assaulted me on a boat on a, it was just like the worst thing I'd ever experienced to that point. I'd never even been in a fight in my life. Like I'd managed to avoid a lot of things that most people in addiction go through, but I, I had no idea how to fight or what to do. So I literally curled into a fetal position and just let her go for it and then ended up going to the hospital. But after that, I had severe anxiety and panic attacks. I couldn't leave my house. I couldn't get on a bus or a SkyTrain. It's like a subway here. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I was like trapped in my house. I was in and out of the hospitals. Just I just felt absolutely crazy because of, my anxiety was so bad. And I had a little baby at the time. He was a toddler. And uh, the only thing that was helping me get through that was drinking. That was the only way I could leave my home. So my alcoholism picked up. Things got really shitty again. Um, and I finally started getting help. I finally started going to counseling. 
And um, because it, my anxiety was so bad, the mental health support started coming in. I got on disability here, so I, ha I got access to more resources to support me. And things started getting better. I went back to school for film and I got paid to go back to school because I was on disability. Nice. So that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I landed like a dream job uh, teaching kids videography and, and social media and stuff. And it was just so cool. I opened a little thrift store, um, met my now husband. We got together. I had this little family. We got a really nice place. Everything's going great. And uh, I was on medication for anxiety, so I was starting to feel better and really get out into the world again. And yeah, and then I got pregnant again. And through my pregnancy, I got really depressed. It was a, a hard pregnancy. Um, he was born two months early and we were in and out of the hospital to visit him. And it was just really devastating. I ended up with postpartum depression and I picked up alcohol <laughs> to try and cope with that. And again, two years later, <laughs> I'm on drugs again. I am, you know, just disappointing and ruining every friendship I have. Um, I ended up having an affair with an ex-boyfriend um, hmm. who lived next door to me and is married to my best friend. <laughs> well, that's, that's a triangle. Yeah, so I was like a walking, talking Jerry Springer episode, and I just felt like, okay, I work in, at the time, I worked doing wedding videography, so I'm with brides all, all the time, and I'm like, well, if they knew what I was up to, they wouldn't hire me, they wouldn't want me around them. I worked with children, and I'm like, well, they, my bosses, if they knew what I was doing, I'd be screwed. Yeah. I would come home to my really amazing husband who loves me to death, and I'm like trying to push him away because I just feel like a disgusting monster. And then I go hang out with my best friend, like just living this lie, and I felt so done with life. I was just like, there's no way I can make up for all of this. I've screwed up everything you can screw up. Like It's just a matter of time before I lose my house and my jobs and everything again. So. I thought, okay, this is it. I gotta go. Like, I can't live anymore. And um, I had a, I, I had planned to not be on this earth like anymore. I really thought that was my only way out. Um, but I managed to confess everything to my mom and get honest for the first time and really tell someone everything that I'd been up to because I was. It was really a secret. And a lot of my friends, when I started going into recovery, were like, "You don't have a problem," because <laughs> I didn't you know people yeah. close to me knew but a lot of people didn't know i was very not like my personality to be doing the things that i was up to so isn't it crazy how we have that duality in our lives yes and the lies and the secrets it's just too much i couldn't live like that um and i know it wasn't meant for me and i definitely know now it wasn't meant for me now that yeah. i've gotten away from it but it's a hard cycle to break and uh yeah so i i talked to my mom. She told me about someone who had went through a 12-step program and changed their lives. And she's like, she told me that if I did that, my husband would forgive me. Like I could get my life back together. And I was just so desperate for that forgiveness. Sounded so good to me that I was willing to do absolutely anything. And so for the first time in my life, I went and got support for alcoholism. And I admitted I had a problem. And I learned about the powerlessness of this disease that I have. I learned I have a disease. I learned that it's not my fault. I'm not defective. I'm not broken. I wasn't cursed. I'm not born dumb or like just a bad person um, that I really couldn't help it. And I learned some solutions to that. And I started practicing spirituality that really was my own. It wasn't kind of what I learned in church or yeah. <laughs> what I saw everyone else doing. And and yeah and it it honestly changed me from the inside out like i for the first time in my life could look people in the eye and could like have a i could do all the things that alcohol was giving me like i'd have a conversation and not feel less than somebody else and not feel insecure and you know hopeless and stupid <laughs> you know all those right. things that alcohol helped me with recovery really gave to me and i felt free for the first time in my life i felt like that book of life everyone else seemed to have, I finally got it. Yes. <laughs> and things were so amazing. Um, you know, my family started coming to meetings to support me, and I saw a lot of healing happening within my own family, which was just so beautiful. Um, but through all this, my brother was struggling with addiction, and 
I was terrified for him because he kept saying, you know, I'm going to stop when I'm 29 like you. And, and I kept thinking like, well, I had a baby. I had two babies. I had two years off in between. <laughs> like I had yeah. to stop and then keep going. And, and, uh, so I was really, really worried about him all the time. I'd pray for him every time I went to a meeting and they'd ask to pray for someone still suffering. Like I would, that who was who I'd pray for. And I did all the things wrong, like trying to codependently fix him and save him and shove recovery down his throat and drag him to meetings and drag meetings to him and and then cut him off completely and not talk to him and and you know put up the boundaries yeah um but then I landed on you know just holding that vision for his life for when he gets recovery and I kept telling him like how amazing things are going to be when he gets it and that I see a, such a great future and he's such a hard worker and he's so funny and he's got such a good life ahead of him and that's kind of where I found the most peace in supporting him it was just really loving on him and not fixing him and not giving him money and not enabling him but really holding a vision for his future and uh so last year in august i turned four years sober and uh congratulations thank you i'll be five years next month today actually <laughs> um but so i turned five years sober i went to see my brother he had two days sober at the time and was dating someone in recovery and was it was i was just so hopeful i'm like this is it he's gonna be okay things are gonna start turning around um and you know, I went there because my my son's one of my son's birthdays is also in August, and so we had a little birthday party for your celebration, and um, it was just such a great day. He was being like the uncle I always thought he could be. He's having water fights with my kids. He did a upside down twerk for my TikTok. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> you know, we we're just having a really good time, and uh, unfortunately soon after that his girlfriend relapsed and then he decided to try her drug of choice for the first time and he never got up in the morning and could not be revived and I got a call from my mom they couldn't get him up and it was like the coronavirus had happened and I had just witnessed one of my friends losing her father and just seeing how hard that was in this climate without being able to really get together with family and having to grieve that way and I just was like how are we going to get through this I don't know what to do and I rushed over to her house and you know I I prayed to God that he would get up I I prayed harder than I ever prayed for anything in my life and usually when I pray that hard God answers my prayer and I honest to God thought he was going to get up like I, I really thought I could do that <laughs> or God could do that but, but yeah he was gone and it was just like the worst day of my life it was that fear I feared for my whole recovery at least um came true like it was my worst fear right there in front of me and uh I honestly didn't think I was going to be able to stay sober through that but I'm so grateful that I had four years under my belt before that happened yeah I had watched my friends lose people and they made it out okay and didn't have to drink over it. I didn't have anyone in my life that still drank. So there was no where to go <laughs> to get drugs or alcohol anymore. Very it just important. so wasn't, yeah, yeah, it wasn't a part of my life at all. And uh, I had really good support and I really saw that, you know, recovery community come together to, to lift me through that really really hard time the things you can get through sober it's mind-boggling but literally any and all conditions it is possible I didn't just go through that's the worst thing that's ever happened in my sobriety but right before I turned two months sober my aunt was murdered and I went to go check on her and found the police there and was like the most that at the time was the most traumatic thing I'd ever been through wow. and all this stuff happens in my sobriety <laughs> like, yeah. you know when I'm drinking life was pretty easy on the outside it was just internally I was dying but then I got sober and all these things externally started happening um losing the 12-year friendship my dad told me he doesn't think I'm really his daughter so there's like trying to find out if I'm really you know, who I Goodness. think I am. Yeah. All the good and all the bad things I always imagine I'd have to drink over. I've not had to pick up a drink and that is such freedom. And even like walking through depression and anxiety and everything coming back after my brother passing away, like I'm able to access help and support and grow and get stronger and heal through it rather than 
destroy my life and everyone else around me and hurt the people I love. So it's such a blessing to be able to do this. And now I'm like podcasting, helping other people get sober. I've written a couple of books on like how to walk through fear. I'm working on another one now about getting through grief and all these things that I've been through are really being used to help other people. And it gives such a meaning and a purpose to like the most horrific things I've ever had to experience. And I never feel alone now. There's like a, a recovery community I can rely on and the higher power I can rely on. And there's always someone that will pick up the phone. And likewise, I get to be there for other people and pick up the phone when they need help. And I feel like that gives me a big purpose in life. I think you made a, a good point there at the end. Like if we don't use our life experiences, good or bad, to help people who are experiencing the same thing or uh, struggling with life events that you went through, it, it seems to me kind of wasted. So, you know, you're, you're doing the books and the podcasting confident that you will help folks with your story. <laughs> and I appreciate you sharing it here today. Life goes on, whether we're in active addiction or in recovery, and we have to learn to cope with things differently, you know, as, mm -hmm. as addicts and alcoholics, um, drugs or alcohol was our primary coping mechanism and you've gone through these huge life events and managed to stay clean and sober. So what tools do you personally use? That's a really good question. I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first thing before I had a real good recovery program um, and I had to walk through my, my aunt's passing in a really horrific way. The first thing I did was learn how to pick up the phone and call and ask for help. And all of them said, no, you can get through this sober. You're going to be okay. And I actually had a step group happening that night and I went to it. I don't know why, but I just, I was, I was on an autopilot. I didn't know what else to do. So yeah. I did what it was on my list to do. And yeah, just picking up the phone and really talking to people and realizing, okay, they say I can get through this, so I'm going to try. And I did I, 24 hours. That's all I focused on was I need to get through today. And then I was like two days away from my two-month chip. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get to Sunday. I'm going to get my two-month chip, and then I'm going to drink. And I just kept doing one day at a time until that two-month chip. So I wanted to keep going, and I just kept going one day at a time. And I think getting through things now, I find... It's so funny because people don't pick up the phone. I want to call and bitch about what's going on yeah. and get support. But I find like, I think it's my higher power stepping in and being like, rely on me. Like, stop calling people. Like, I'm here for you. Come to me first. Meditation has been huge for me. I actually find that to be a very important tool in my recovery because I do deal with anxiety and panic attacks. So yeah. learning to be mindful and all that kind of stuff was so helpful and uh, learning to ask for help when I need it and just being okay with that and set a boundary and be like, no, you gotta take care of this. Like I'm going to go take care of myself right now, especially with my husband. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's been really important. Really before something bad happens, putting your routine together so that you're on autopilot and you go to your meeting and you pick up a book and you do the things that, that you're doing every yes. day anyways. Um, because sometimes you can't think when you're in trauma like that and you, it's hard to know what to do. So Exactly. You know, right. if you're, yeah, that's why we pick up a drink because that's what we're used to doing. So that's, if you're used to doing main, something else, that's yeah. our main coping mechanism. Exactly. What does your meditation routine look like? I've really been loving walking meditations lately because I have three kids now. I've been finding it a lot more difficult to get yeah, like, a moment to myself. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Mommy's going for a walk. Yeah. So I learned about walking meditations this year, actually. And I also got diagnosed with ADHD in December. Um, which just made so much sense to my life. Uh, actually, getting help for grief, I found out I was having ADHD. So yay! <laughs> um, but it, it answered a lot of questions for me, and so I know movement's really important to help me. Um, and I find it a lot easier to meditate that way and just be really mindful, like paying attention to what's around me, listening to the sounds, um, looking at the trees and even like the little bugs on the trees and just being really, really, really present about where I'm at and what's around me has been beautiful lately. Uh, before that, I did guided meditations and I found that very helpful because it was hard to get started. Sitting still is like the most uncomfortable thing in the world. I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> this is like <laughs> the majority of my sitting. There you go. Like yeah. this is the, a meditation right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I like listening to somebody tell me what to do so that I'm not just sitting in silence. Do you use the Calm app? I have, have used you? the Calm app. Yeah. I really like Insight Timer is my favorite. Okay, cool. I, have to yeah. I haven't checked that one out, but I will. Yeah, I actually got my meditation teacher training this year. I did 100 hours to learn how to teach people how to meditate. So it's been nice. really cool. Because I wanted to talk about the work that you do with sober entrepreneurs. And I think that is huge. And the fact that, you know, you say on your website that the sober community is often sort of pushed aside or forgotten for our talents. And I think mm -hmm. that is so true. Do you want just to touch on that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I started um, a podcast called Seek Purpose uh, about two years ago. And we were talking about finding purpose after addiction. I ended up getting to talk to the most incredible people. And everyone's doing amazing things now that they're sober and trying to make up for less time and like spreading the message and having all this value to give the world. Not just the recovery world either. Like there's so many tools that we learn here that my mom needed. She wasn't an addict, but she definitely qualified for Al-Anon and, and um, you know, there's just so many people in the world suffering without addiction or have addictions to video games, to social media, to all these other things that right. these tools can really help with. And yeah, I just, I love people in recovery, especially recovery entrepreneurs, because it's just like, we've been to the, the hell and back yes. and, you know, it's like kind of the fuck it buttons hits, like whatever, I just want the best life I can get and how can I get there? And there's like less fear, there's less everything in the way because you already know what it's like to, to lose everything and you know that you're going to be okay anyway. So um, I really noticed that pattern through doing the podcast and I, and a lot of people were reaching out to me to help them put it together, their websites or their own podcasts. Uh, I started working with nonprofits, helping support them get their podcast launched and, and do some social media stuff for them. And I thought, well, here's a business. Like <laughs> I could really, totally, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I could help people who are helping people. So then, like, not only am I putting so something out into the world that is is fun, I enjoy doing. It's like in grade seven, I got sent to IBM to learn how to build websites and stuff. It's something I've always loved to do. Um, so yeah, and I feel like you know all these skills and talents are given to me for a reason. If I can use them to help people build their dreams and and support other people in their communities, like that just feels like such a huge win to me. Yeah, and, it's like uh, the a different branch of the tree that keeps exactly. sort of extending out, you know. Yeah. Um, and we found each other through the recovery community on Instagram, which is just amazing and so mm -hmm. supportive and just a wealth of knowledge. It's boundless. So if you are not involved in the recovery community on Instagram, I highly recommend it. There are some amazing people out there who are willing to help uh, day and night. So that is a huge resource if you are looking for new sober friends or sober activities. Collaboration over competition. Mm -hmm. That just jumped off the page at me. <laughs> And I think that's so important for us supporting one another, but it, I mean, it's also just like a, an amazing life lesson and it can be applied to anything in life. Mm -hmm. Where was that idea born from? Um, well, it's from walking through a lot of jealousy and insecurity <laughs> like, yeah. and being in competition with people and just how horrible that made me feel. And I really opened up to the idea, um, I don't know why I just grew up with this idea that like if ever, I guess because I, I lived in poverty and I saw everybody else have all this stuff and I and I learned through growing up like if other people have things that means I can't have them and so I had this really like complex that I just kind of grew up with and like there was a finite amount of things yeah okay. yeah and then I through recovery I started learning about manifestation and law of attraction and all these other things started opening up to me and I started learning how like abundant the world is and how like how to deal with jealousy and insecurity and everything and realize like how all those things are just me seeing what I desire, right? And yeah. it's not about the other person. And as I healed my own traumas and insecurities and whatever and started really embracing people and living on people and realizing there is no competition, it just felt so beautiful to me. Um, it really is. Yeah. And it's, I love it. It, it makes a huge difference in work and 
in recovery. You kind of have to do it in recovery because like, you know, like, I don't know, there's no room for that, that shit in recovery. Like you don't get to stay sober if you're constantly comparing yourself to other people. Right. So exactly right. It truly is fulfilling to help other people, but there is that aspect of it too, where it's ensuring our own sobriety. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. And people are so fucking grateful if you're <laughs> supporting yeah. them and like, right. you know, shutting them out, doing that kind of stuff. Like it, it comes back to you. And if it doesn't come back from that person, it comes back in a different way. And it's just been proven to me over and over again. If I stay on this path, my life is so much better. As soon as I get into comparing myself with other people and feeling like a competition or I'm not good enough, then I'm starting to burn myself out trying to be as good as them or, you know, like yeah. my life just isn't as good. And so I really... Yeah, I want to make sure that's a big thing with all the people I work with. Um, I want to help get them connected and supporting each other as well and, and create kind of a network there. It's a very new baby business. Like I just started this a month ago, so. <laughs> um, but I've got big plans. <laughs> what do you hope listeners hear from you on the podcast today? I think the biggest kind of through line through my whole recovery is you can stay sober through any and all conditions. You never have to pick up a drink again. You never have to pick up a drug again. You never have to like suffer in an eating disorder. You don't really have to suffer in life. <laughs> There's going to be tragic things that happen. Things are going to be hard. Life is always lifey and humans are always human. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> yeah. But you can actually, you can get through everything. You don't have to suffer in it. Like I still hurt. I still have pain. I still cry. I still get angry and irritated and all those kind of things, but I'm not stuck in it anymore. I get to heal through all of it. And every time I walk through something hard, I come out the other, the other end with some beautiful gifts and lessons. There's like no bullshit in the world I take anymore because of what happened with my brother. Like I just got so clear on what um, I'm spending my time on and who I'm spending my time with. And, you know, I got really this weird superpower being able to say no. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> And protect my energy. It's so, the best yeah. word, the most powerful <laughs> word. Keep it in it your really back is. pocket. It's, yeah. It's very useful. Yeah, I think that's that's my big message. Brooke Robichaud, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today, friends. Huge thank you to Brooke for being so open and honest. Hopefully you heard something that resonates with you. And if we help just one person, our job is done. You can find all things podcast related and subscribe to our show at the sobriety diaries.com youtube.com slash Nate Kelly, where we upload today's video podcast or on Instagram at the sobriety diaries pod. All of this will also be in today's show notes. Check back soon for new episodes with new stories to tell, but until then try your best not to drink and be good to yourself. Bye friends.